All right, back here talking Mets on the podcast. Had a very, very busy offseason for them. A lot of names coming and going here. Join me today, break it all down. Good friend of the podcast. He has his own Mets blog, the Apple NYM. He's also the host of the Simply Amazing podcast. Uh, Tim Ryder is here. Tim, how are you? Doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Oh, I'm glad to come back on here. And I got to say, my head's sort of still spinning in terms of all the things that are happening with the Mets in the offseason here. What's your general take on, on the work they've done over the last like month and a half? Oh, my goodness. I mean, it, it, it's one thing to, I guess, internally keep themselves up to snuff where they want to be. It's another to keep themselves up with the rest of the National League East, the rest of the National League in general, whatever else the rest of the league is doing, if this team really has uh, aspirations of winning a World Series. And um, as of right now, I think that they're, they are, they've gone above and beyond. Yeah, they certainly have. Here. I feel like this is all triggered, I think, again, by uh... – so like last year when Steven Matt spurning them and going to the Cardinals for the deal sort of got Steve Cohen angry starting this big spending spree. I think the big thing here was Jacob DeGrom leaving for Texas and specifically that press conference we had where he was talking about how they had this great World Series vision for the 68-win team. So what was your reaction to all of that? <laughs> well, um, I think it's going to take some time. I do think that Texas has a – they do have a vision. I, I do think that they have a, a solid core that they're spending a lot of money on. Um, you know, it, I, I it, in the division that they're in, I, I don't think it's going to be an overnight success. I do think that they have the foundation in place, but um, yeah, I think Bruce Bochy leading the way is going to be good for them. I think the offense that they have is going to be good for them, and of course, a, a pitcher like Jacob Degrom heading up the rotation is going to be huge. Uh, I think it's going to be up to them to you know do what they can to try to move ahead of the the Angels, the the Mariners, and and hopefully contend with the Astros. Yeah, I mean, the way I sort of see it is, look, I said this before. I said, it's like, you know what, like, this is like a nobody's wrong situation here. I say, you know what, like, good, like, he has the right to leave. He's right to go pay all he wants and go play in Texas if he wants. And the Mets probably have the smart choice not to give him the contract that Texas did. But to me, the thing that bothers me is, like, don't sit here and tell us that the vision of the Texas Rangers won 68 games better than the vision of the Mets that won 101. That doesn't, that doesn't fly for me. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly seems like he did. He he wanted to move on from New York, and again, that's that's his prerogative. That's his decision. Um, you know, I, I think for the last few years he's been generally open about. Oh, I, I'd like to. You know, I think it would be cool to stay with one team his whole career. And and uh, you know, I guess a lot of people did not expect Jacob Degrom to be leaving Flushing this this winter, but he did. And I think the Mets had to pivot, and and they've done so really, really well. It certainly has. Yeah, start with the pit, the big pivot here, where they go replace Jason Gron, take the ground the only way they could. They get Justin Verlander on this two year deal for eighty six point six million. Gets the same AAV as Max Scherzer, and now you have the reigning AL Cy Young Award winner top in the rotation with Max Scherzer in New York. What do you think about the Verlander signing? Oh, I mean that that's huge. I, I don't think the Mets could have gone any other way, considering they had to fill such a big hole in Jacob Degrom's absence. And, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, sure. Justin Verlander's 39 going on 40 coming off of Tommy John surgery two years ago, but you couldn't tell if you looked at his, if, if you looked at his, uh, statistics, uh, he's absolutely at the top of his game. He's, he's, uh, a hall of fame pitcher. As long as he can stay fresh and stay healthy, he's going to be effective. And that's, um, just a, a wonderful way to kind of just, seamlessly glide into the next chapter of whatever this Mets rotation is going to be. Um, sure. It's a lot of money, but I, I think if you, you know, if you're the Mets and if you have the money to spend, and if you do have certain goals that you have to reach and certain, you know, I guess marks that you have to hit to keep up, then yeah, you have to go all out. Yeah, I feel like the common thing I like here is obviously win now team. He's the most win now fit in terms of replacing the Grom on the team. Plus like, they love these high average salary short term deals that gives them really they sort of reset their books every few years. And this sort of fits that bill too. Oh, absolutely. And the, it lowers the risk with a an aging pitcher who, you know, and this kind of goes for anybody. It's not just a just Justin Verlander, it's not just a Max Scherzer, it's not just a um, you know, thirty seven, thirty eight plus year old pitcher. Um, everybody can, you know, Stay healthy. I mean, for everyone, it's a challenge to stay healthy. And 
Uh, I think the Mets did a real good job of limiting their risk in the case of a of a going on forty year old pitcher, um, and they have the depth to kind of work with that as well. And of course, they've added to it too. Yeah, they certainly have. Here, I want to talk about the one move sort of flowing to the radar here because it came in between all the signings. Here was this trade they swung with Tampa Bay to get lefty Brooks Rally for the bullpen exchange for prospect uh, Keyshawn Askew here. So, what do you about this move? Because it gives them, a, like, I mean, they lost Jolie Rodriguez. This feels like an upgrade to that on that lefty component of the bullpen here. Sure, I mean, it, Joely Rodriguez. He was a really. I, I liked him as a reliever. I think that he was more effective versus right-handers than he was against left uh, against lefties, and I think that kind of goes back to the Mets never really replacing Aaron Loop a couple of of uh, off seasons ago, and they were kind of grasping at straws at times, hoping to find a. I don't want to say a loogie, but someone who could consistently keep lefties at bay. And from, from all accounts, I don't know much about Rayley or Rally, um, but from, from all accounts, he's going to be uh, a useful cog in the, in the bullpen. Um, he can get lefties out and you just kind of have to hope for the best. Personally, I don't know much about him. I didn't know much about Askew either. Uh, you know, from what I'm hearing, Askew was a, a high A pitcher with a, reasonably high ceiling, but there's still so, you know, so far to go before they can hit this level. And, you know, for the Mets to fill a need with a, with a, a high, a lower level prospect, I think that's a, uh, that's a home run for them. Yeah, it is here. And now let's get to some of the other big uh, signings here. They start out here, bringing Jose Quintana two years, $26 million deal here at a reliable back rotation guy. He's a ton of starts here. He had the, Resurgent year after struggling in 20 and 21. He comes back with the Pirates and Cardinals and ends up starting for the Cardinals. Big guys down the stretch. What do you think about the Quintana move? Love it. Absolutely love it. I think this is an upgrade to the back of the Mets bullpen, not the back of the Mets rotation from where it was. And that's not necessarily a knock on Carlos Carrasco or, uh, or Taiwan Walker. Um, and I still think Carrasco can be a useful piece in this rotation too. But I think Quintana almost usurps Carrasco out of. The, the top three, or, or even the fourth. I mean, you could be looking at the rotation, and, and as far as production value, it's very it's 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 very easy to think that Quintana could end up with a better, you know, with a more productive season than Carrasco does. And no, that's not a knock. I think that's just how the cookies crumble. <laughs> no pun intended in Carrasco's case, but <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that having a group of good pitchers is gonna that internal competition that we've seen happen a bunch of times whether it's on the pitching side whether it's on the positional side I think it's gonna let the staff really grow it's gonna you're gonna have your two top dogs leading the way in Verlander and Scherzer and everyone's kind of you know gonna want to keep up gonna want to keep you know keep stay yeah stay effective and I really do think it's gonna work out well and, and Quintana is like a glue piece in all of it yeah, I think I love about him, especially with the serum. You have two older guys at the top of the rotation here. back, and he really makes like at least like twenty eight starts, which every year he's in the rotation full time. That's something I think that he's very useful for the Mets. Oh, sure, and he's not a strikeout guy. He's pitching to contact, and I think that you know that suits this, especially you know this defense. The Mets defense is terrific. Um, it's gonna it's gonna play to that. Um, you know, you don't need to go out and strike out two hundred guys a, a year and. Um, in the case of Quintana, I mean, he's not, uh, there were a couple of seasons there. He, I think it looked like he was really going for high strikeouts. And, uh, I mean, as you can see is his numbers really didn't reflect that. And once he got back to basics last year, I mean, he put up a 2.93 ERA four win season was, you know, higher than he's, uh, excuse me, more productive than he's been since probably the 2017, 2016 season. Uh, yeah, big year for him. Yeah, and the big move here, I think this is the string of start after the uh, the Grom for, uh, press conference here. The one that came out of nowhere, just sort of surprised, I think, everybody in the Met world, is that we heard rumors that Brandon Nemo was gone, biggest mark on baseball, Giants might pay here after Aaron Judge goes. All of a sudden, we hear he's back eight years, $162 million. What's your reaction to that contract? Well, I actually, you know, when the numbers were getting thrown out that, you know, there was teams in on Nemo for six years and, 20, 25 million, 27 million. I was a little hesitant. Um, I really was. 
you know, he's had injury issues and whether they were major or not, um, you know, there's no question that when Brandon Nimmo is healthy, he's one of the most productive position players in baseball. No question. You just have to keep him on the field. And it, it always seems to be like little things, a um, bunch of like finger injuries and stuff like that. That neck injury was really, really concerning, but he's really seemed to move past that. And he's become such a great fielder and his offense just continues. Even when he's not going up there um, looking for walks, you know, it, it, it's almost like he's, he's out there doing exactly what the team needs him to do. I think we saw it so many times last year where, you know, first inning uh, of a game, he's going to look at three, four pitches. He doesn't care if he's going to put him in, in, in a two strike hole because he's going to let his teammates get a good look at the guy ahead of him and hopefully go from there. But then, you know, he can put himself in a hole and still get on base or draw a walk. Doesn't matter if he's, you know, one and two. He could, all right, guys, I got it from here. Let's let's go ahead and get things into gear. And he can. Um, yeah, the strides that he's made, the progress that he's made as a player, and now being able to bring him in the fold, sure, it's for a long time, but you're getting him through the prime of his career. And, you know, at $20 million a year, it's a lot more palatable than 25. And it also gives the Mets, you know, I don't want to say financial flexibility because they really don't need that anymore, but it gives them the ability to maybe shuffle money around and earmark something for somebody that maybe wasn't earmarked before. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it does. I do think in terms of the, also the win now mentality of like, this is a guy, yes, the, the years are longer you wanted to do and the money is high, but like, if they were going to win this year, they did not really have a choice at to, other than to bring Nimmo back because our other options are basically either moving Mar- Starling Marte to center field at 34, which was asking for a lot of injury risks, or emptying your farm system to go and get something like Brian Reynolds. I don't think they want to do that either. Like if it, the choice is money over years or, you know, drilling tr- tr- projects for a guy like Reynolds, I'd rather just pay the money. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, when it was, when it was getting up to a higher AAV, um, I was a little hesitant and I was – kind of talking myself into, well, you know, Nemo's going to be 33, 34 in a few years anyway. What's, what's the, what's the, you know, there's not a big problem moving a, a veteran, you know, a, a decent veteran outfielder into center field if he's capable. Um, I was prepared for it. And again, if Nemo gets hurt, you have to think that Marte is going to be a center, a center fielder. But um, yeah, it just the, the way that everything kind of came together and, the way that they were able to lower the AAV and lengthen the years, it, it, it works out for everybody. And, and as long as he stays healthy, he's going to be one of the, he's a run machine, whether he's scoring runs, producing runs, creating runs, he's a run machine. It's, it's, um, it's uncanny. I think he can finish, you know, his Mets career, which he's going to finish as a Met most likely, um, as one of the, you know, the, 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 better offensive players in franchise history. And I, that's probably not even exaggeration. He's, he's on that track. Yeah, he certainly is here. Go down to the bullpen from it back to the bullpen again, because the other one sort of snuck in right behind him. was David Robertson, a one year, $10 million deal. And a lot of Mets fans were upset. They didn't get up the trade deadline. He helped the Phillies <laughs> down the stretch here. Now he's here as the primary bridge to Edwin Diaz. I think this is also a very strong move. Absolutely. I wouldn't actually, I wouldn't mind adding another true, eighth inning setup type person just to really lengthen out that, that bullpen, give it a lot of experience depth. And, you know, Robertson still at the top of his game. I think he's going to segue perfectly into those, into those back innings. Um, I said it on simply amazing yesterday talking with, uh, with Taryn Sharma, uh, excuse me, Taryn Sharma, my co-host. And I wouldn't be against bringing Trevor May back if he's interested in, in, in a reunion. Um, I think that he would bridge those seventh and eighth innings really, really well. I think that he can probably, you know, come on board at a, at a very reasonable um, price point. And, uh, you know, by all accounts, again, outside perspective, it looked like May was genuinely happy in New York. And I really think that uh, if they have the opportunity to add more Robertson-like depth into that back end it's just going to make them just that much more better of a team 
Yeah, I also love the fact that like you bring Robinson, you know he can do it in this in this market. It's not something you can always guarantee for relievers. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and with a guy like Robertson who's proven and he's still effective and he's still got that fire to him and he's still able to get big outs in big spots. I mean, you saw it in the postseason. You know, that's just invaluable to a, to any ball club. Being that it's the Mets, I mean, for a Mets fan, it's even better. Yeah, it certainly is here. And obviously, the the big surprise also came on uh, Saturday night, late in the night here, that the Mets do pull off the move they don't really do very often. They go into the uh, Japanese free agent market. They sign Kodai Senga to a five-year, $75 million deal, lower AAV than what Tyon Walker gets and what Chris Batts ends up getting here. The thing I love about this deal is, obviously, this is a market they don't exploit enough. They, never, they sort of abandon on the Will Ponds of the Kazmat Sui flame out here, and... I love that this this guy wanted to come here, wanted to embrace analytics and improve his game. And I feel like as a number three, this is a lot less pressure on coming to the big city here. And like, this is a chance to be a real home run for the Mets if they can develop this guy correctly. Oh my goodness, huge. All right, so just the, the price point alone is terrific. When you look at his, his stuff, his metrics, and of course it's in the, the, the Japanese uh, Central and Pacific Leagues, but you know, you look at, what he's doing and his repertoire as a pitcher, he's hitting 102, 103 with his fastball. He's got a ghost fork ball. It comes off like a splitter, but he almost, he, he kind of pronates his arm when he throws it like a changeup. So it's dipping like a splitter. It's moving like a changeup. And it's not like, like the, the, the rotation of the pitch is unlike most, uh, unlike anything most major league hitters have seen going to take a lot of adapting and adjusting um you know with the stuff that he has he should be a really really big strikeout threat in japan he wasn't that guy as much i mean and you know he, he's striking out nine ten batters uh, per nine in japan but those are hitters with approaches more geared towards contact you bring in a guy like senga into the major leagues where hitters are very power happy they're very launch angle friendly <laughs> and everyone's got holes in their swings. If he has the command and control that people think he does, and he's able to, yeah, I guess, translate that to the majors. I think he, he could honestly have number two type ceiling written all over. And if the Mets bring him in, we're able to brought bring him in for, you know, five years, 75 million. And he has that type of ceiling. This could be one of the better signings in recent Mets history. Yeah, that's for sure. Here, and I mean, if, if they spent a lot of money. They spent three hundred sixty million dollars last week. I think it's about four sixty two when you add Edwin Diaz in uh, for what he did early in the off season here. And there's a lot of like people like on the Twitter vacuum going, "Oh, the Mets spent a lot of money. They're the exact same team. They haven't improved at all." Do you agree with that comparison? You think they actually found ways to improve the roster? I think they have. I think they are improving the roster. Um, I think that. They, they had to pivot in the ways that they did. I'm sure that they had a plan heading into the offseason. Those plans changed. And, you know, being back on solid footing is one thing. Being where they are now, I think that's another. And um, I think they have improved. I, I, you know, winning 101 games, you don't do that just with the roster. You need a lot of breaks during the season. You not, not, not like rest breaks, but you need to like catch a lot of breaks. You need to, you know, there's got to be luck involved. There's got to be skill involved. There's got to be, you know, injury and health. Um, I guess avoiding those things, you know, there's a lot, it's almost like a perfect storm. Um, you know, look at the Mets, they were a hundred one win team, but you know, you look at them from September 1st on last year and they weren't that team. Uh, you know, you, if you want to replicate what they did last year, I mean, you can, try picking that apart until the cows come home. I don't think you ever really will. As long as the Mets stay competitive and stay in the mix and keep themselves, you know, with momentum towards their goal, I mean, it doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, the personnel, but as long as they're able to hit the marks that they thought they were last year internally, and that's on every different facet, whether it's on a a player to player comparison, whether it's just on a value comparison. Oh, hey, we got we got this much out of this guy last year. If we can get you know this much out of these two this year and kind of replace that that value, you know, 
it, it should put you in the same spot. But again, this is all how the how the thing how everything is kind of going to unravel throughout the season. I think the Mets are putting themselves in a really really good position to succeed and to hopefully put themselves back on track to you know being another you know heavy duty competitor in the National League or in the major leagues. But um, yeah, I, I do think that they're they still have. I guess I would say they still have a couple of pieces they probably have to add, but yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable with what they've done so far, and I think that they are well on their way to staying just as competitive as, as they have been. Sorry if we got a little long-winded there, but it's kind of a deep question. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. I do think, I agree, they do have a couple more pieces to add. I do think that the heavy lifting is probably done here. I don't I don't think they're going to be surprising as a Carlos Correa contract out of nowhere here. I do think that, like... <laughs> I think that more likely their moves are probably going to be, you know, maybe you know, add another arm to that bowl like you were talking about earlier. I could see also a fourth outfield type being in here. So maybe somebody could play center field like an Adam Duvall. What do you think you'd like to see them do to sort of wrap up their offseason? Yeah, I would like to see um, another. I, I would love to see some more pop in their lineup. I don't know how they're going to achieve that at this point. But, you know, even if I think Francisco Alvarez, um, having him as your right handed DH. And whether roll back because you're left-handed DH or whatever the case may be, I think those two as a tandem could potentially add more power to a lineup throughout a, a full season. But I think they need more than that. I think adding a corner outfielder who can, of course, feel the position but can also add a little pop would be big. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating for Nelson Cruz. He's up in his 40s. But if a guy like Nelson Cruz is out there who I, I don't even really have a, a real comparison, but who can give you at bats, even as a DH, even as a pinch hitter? I know that that Buck didn't really uh, employ much of a, a pinch hitting approach last year, but with the DH, I guess that's to be expected. But you know, if Nelson Cruz is still hitting the tar out of the ball, I wouldn't be opposed to something like that, even as just a guy on the bench. Um, I think the Mets just, you know, they need that. That was one of the dynamics they didn't have last year. And I think extra or added power kind of has to be a priority, even if they're going through depth additions. Even if they're not adding a big, big, big addition, they have to bring in people who can add that dynamic. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear what you mean, Tim. Thanks for all the time. Really appreciate it. Before I let you go, we have people follow on social media and keep up with uh, all your Mets coverage. Oh, cool. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me, man. I, I truly have a great time whenever I spend time with you here. And you can find me on Twitter. It's Timothy R. Ryder. That's R-Y-D-E-R. Uh, the Apple is at the Apple N-Y-M. That's on Twitter. Uh, you find all of our links there. And Simply Amazing Pod, you find that anywhere you're listening to podcasts, uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever. You just pop it into Google, you'll find us. And uh, everything is you know, free to subscribe. Come join the party. And uh, we hope to see you uh, to see you. Coming this season, we're going to have some big news on our end. Absolutely, Tim. Thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mike.